So the barber walks up to open his shop, and he takes the closed sign and turns it to open. And in walks the town baker. And the town baker's getting his hair cut, and barber's talking to him, and says, you know what? I know that you give all those day-old donuts and pastries and stuff away to people that are in need. I just really respect that. You know what? Free haircut for you today. Next day, the barber shows up to open his shop, and there's a dozen donuts waiting for him. Pretty cool. Later that day, the town florist comes in, and he's cutting the florist's hair, and he goes, you know what? I know that sometimes you take some flowers that maybe you could still sell a little bit for a profit, but you give them to a funeral home so that some people that are having burials and funerals that can't afford decent flowers, they got something. They may not be the best, but they got something. I really appreciate that. It's awesome what you do for our community. Free haircut for you today. Next day, Barbara comes to open his shop. A dozen roses waiting for him. So later that afternoon, the local pastor comes in. He's going, Pastor, you do a great job serving the spiritual needs of our people and caring for their soul. I really appreciate it. Free haircut for you today. The next day, Barbara shows up. A dozen pastors waiting for him. <laughs> yeah, doesn't, yep, yep. Sometimes uh, some professions get a bad rap. Sometimes it's deservedly so. Over the past 10 to 15 years or so, the uh, profession slash calling that I get to serve in hasn't always been put in the best light between liars, adulterers, embezzlers, pedophile pastors, and the like. So and I didn't plan this until I realized, but I know it's the week right after high school camp, but parents or parents-to-be, how would you respond if your child came to you and said, Mom, Dad, God called me into the ministry. What would your first response be? What would your second response be? What fears would start to climb up into your heart, into your mind? What all of a sudden would you be concerned about that you weren't concerned about before? What would your thought be if your child told you that God called them into ministry? What if they were 14 years old? What if they were 24? What if they were like Anthony and it was 34 years old, approximately, and he's having a conversation with his parents? Hey, I'm going to leave this successful career that you helped me launch into, and God's called me into the ministry. It's a difficult conversation. Would they be met with a, man, that's awesome! Oh, wait, that's going to be, are you sure? Isn't there something else you could do? That's okay if you do that on the side, but you're going to get a real job first, right? Why do we think that? What would we be concerned about? What would we be worried about? But we would be. I want to ask you to do something with me for a moment. I want you to get the visual picture in your mind of all the pastors you've ever had. Pastors, worship pastors. Now, for some of you, it's going to be real easy. It's you, dude, that's it. You're the only pastor I've ever known. But for some of you, it's not. Think through. Get their face in your, in your, in your mind. Put their name next to it. Maybe there's 20, maybe, maybe there's three or four. Remember, they're people. They have pain. They try and do their job their best they can. Maybe some of your pastors were superstars. They were awesome. And maybe some of them super crashed. Like some of us do sometimes. Next question. In just a moment, I'll ask you to raise your hand. But if you were, are you part of a pastor's family? Pastor, worship pastor, Sunday school pastor. But in some way, you would consider yourself, some people call them PKs, pastor kids. But you are, you are some way related or connected to or were at one time in a, in a pastoral family as well as possibly you're, uh, you were used to be or bivocational. Maybe your dad worked full time, but he pastored. And so when you went to church, you weren't just going to church. It's like, no, I got to listen to my dad again, <laughs> again. If you were ever part of a pastor's family, would you hold your hand up for a good five count that people see? These are the people that need the most prayer. They're PKs. Pastor's kids, these, these, these pastor's kid. You yeah, remember PKs. Katy Perry is a PK. Katy Perry, PK has gone wild. But you know who messes up the PKs, don't you? It's the board members' kids. They're the ones that mess up the pastor's kids. It's the board members' kids. We got a lot of those connected in the church. We had about, we had about maybe 15, and I'm going to guess 15 to 20 in the second service, and about seven or eight in the first service, actually, as well. As well. So think with me for a moment. What if you burned out? I mean, what if you burned out, flamed out, full-scale clinical depression? <laughs> Who's it going to affect? There's a lot of people in your life that are depending on you. There's a lot of people in your life that need you. 
that are connected to you, that look up to you. And just for the, for the, for the illustration, not because I'm quote-unquote more important, what if your pastor full-scale burned out? By the way, there's no, no, nothing to announce, nothing to confess today. We're just talking. What if your pastor full-scale burned out? Full-scale clinical depression, and all of a sudden, it's discovered that he's an absolute fraud. Absolute fraud. Lies, cheats, adultery. Although you don't have to worry about me running off with my secretary. Have you seen Travis Burgett? Yeah, that ain't happening. That ain't happening. He's much too short for me. Yep, yep. What if you found out your pastor was a total fraud? Some of you are going, that would stink. But it doesn't matter. We're committed to following Christ. We're not following that, that pastor anyways. And that's what it should be, and that's good. But that's probably only half the church. Not that half the church is following me, but half the church is still so new in their faith. All it's going to take is one really good speed bump, and boom, the cart's going to fall apart. And everyone in their life that's been telling them they shouldn't be going to church anyways is going to be going, I told you there's nothing there. I told you they were just after money. I told you that. Come on, hang out with us. And there's going to be some collateral damage. Anthony asked this question the other week. I'm just going to tweak it. He asked, does your balance of work and rest please God? Not does it work out well for your health and your finances, but does it please God? We're going to look at it today from the pastor's perspective. And if you have your bulletins, go ahead and pull them out. If not, ushers are coming. They can get one to you. You're off today. So there's no blanks to fill in today, but you may want to jot a few things down just the same. So this is the last message in the series on pause. Next Sunday, I've got one down in the front here, JB. Next Sunday will be Father's Day. I'm doing a, 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 the whole baseball theme. So if you've got Royals or Cardinal stuff, you want to wear it, bring it. Someone's going to let me borrow a Hosomer. Is that how you pronounce his name? Hosomer jersey? I know it's Hosmer. Don't give me, I know it's Hosmer. Some of you are going, he shouldn't be allowed to wear the jersey if he can't pronounce it. I know it's Hosmer. But I don't know his first name. Is it Brett? What is it? Eric, okay, I did not know his first name, full disclosure there. The, uh, so we'll, we'll be tagging that in, and I'm excited about next Sunday's message. But today we're going to take a little different turn. We're going to look at some scriptures that have to do about pastors and ministers. What is their role? What are they supposed to do? Think through all those people you thought earlier when we were talking about pastors and ministers. What are they supposed to do? Come on, don't they only work half a day a week? What do they need any time off for? Come on, man. They're like school teachers who only work, you know, just part of the day. They're off by 3.30. Then they're off for spring break and Christmas break. And they get eight, eight months off in the summer. Isn't that how it works? Obviously not. And we got a lot of people working in the education field that are here right now. The, but I want to help you understand the mindset of an average pastor. Not necessarily this one. I could be below or above average. The, uh, then I want to show you the results from last Sunday. Last Sunday, if you were here, there was a card in the bulletin. It simply said... Please mark down three things you expect from your pastoral staff. Not just this guy, but the pastoral staff. Anthony, Zeke, Marissa. And I told you it'd be all over the map. And it is. And it is. And I can't wait to show it to you. The, uh, so let's talk about a couple biblical principles. Because this is probably not going to be, my goodness. My goodness. All right. How many of you are 50 or older? Put your hand up. Look how few of you are in this room. Look how few. Come on. Some, some of you have been to church before. We're only at 50 and older in the room, right? So... For many of you, this is not the last church you're ever going to attend. Let's be honest. Chances are the pastor of this church is not going to do your funeral in 50 years. You're probably going to move or live somewhere else at some time in your life. And so you're going to be choosing a church and as well as choosing who your pastor will be. So this, will click, this should click in. First off, ministry is amazingly fulfilling and it's awfully draining at the same time. A couple things about ministry. It's a trustworthy saying, if anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, insert the word pastor there for a simple context, he desires a noble task. Mom, Dad, God's coming to the ministry. That's a noble task. It's noble. Doesn't mean it's better than, than someone who's fixing shoes or someone who's working at Walmart, but this is a noble task. The analogy scripture gives is a shepherd. We don't have a lot of good shepherd illustrations in our culture, so I would suggest considering the word coach. That's over lots of people. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Why do sheep need shepherds? Don't they just naturally do what they're supposed to do? Why does a football team need a coach? Doesn't the, don't the players naturally do what they're supposed to do? No. But if somebody leads, they can be a whole lot more effective and powerful in what they're trying to do. Uh, job description for a pastor. It was Christ who gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, and some people to be pastors and teachers 
What are they supposed to do? To prepare God's people for works of service. Hello, rewind. The pastor's job, the other pastors that we have on staff, one of the most important things they do is not what they do, it's who they train to do other things. To do the work of the ministry. Why do we prepare God's people for works of service? So the body of Christ can be built up. And we can reach unity in the faith, not uniformity. We don't need everybody wearing the same shirt. Not everyone has amazing fashion sense like you and I have and, and you and I have. Some people wear different clothing. But we don't need uniformity, but we need unity in the faith. Why? So we can know God's Son and become mature. Which, thank you, Jesus, not all, everyone in this church is mature in their faith. That's a good thing. Have you ever been part of an organization or a church where everyone was mature in their faith? That means there ain't no one getting saved. No one's coming to know Christ. Nothing new is being birthed. It's actually a dead place where everyone is mature in their faith. So we're working hard to get people mature so we can attain to the whole measure of Christ. How do you do that? Five, six million ways maybe. Depends what culture you live in. Depends what part of America you live in. Inner city church would operate differently than rural church, operate differently than, than, uh, than big city. Depends what part of the world you're in. There's ways to do church that haven't even been invented yet. In 1966, if you would have said, this is what the church of Jesus Christ is going to look like in America, you'd have been way off. And right now, if someone were to say, hey, it's 2016, let me tell you what the church is going to look like in 2066, they're probably going to be way off. But what I can tell you is if Jesus tarries for another 500 years and he doesn't return, I don't know if there's still going to be a Russia. I don't know if there's still going to be a Middle East. I don't know if there's still going to be an America. But there will still be the church of Jesus Christ on this planet. And it will be doing just fine regardless of whatever government stands in its way or whatever government tries to get behind and prop it up. The church will be doing just fine. He will build his church. No gates are going to stop that. The uh, ministers deserve respect because of their work. We ask you, brothers, respect those who work hard among you. Pastors should work hard. They should work hard. Who are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Ouch, admonish. That's that word that uh, means the pastor doesn't just say, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you. You can go now. No, sometimes they say things that are pointed or maybe hurt a little bit, but for the purpose of growing up and maturing. Hold them in the highest regard of, uh, in love because of their work. Pastors should be followed. Obey your leaders, submit to their authority, but be careful. Do not take that verse out of context. Don't take that too far. Or you turn into a cult. Make sure you're following what Scripture has to say. These people that are pastors keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Does your boss hold you accountable? Do you work at a bank and have to turn your, or, or, or a place where you collect money and you have to turn your register in and make sure that you're not off, that accidentally $100 didn't disappear into your wallet or someone else's wallet? You have to give an account. I have to give an account. I have a board meeting this afternoon and I'm accountable to them, but that's not my final account. I give an account, I want God's smile. Do I want your smile? Let's be honest for a moment. Absolutely. What if I told you your smile did not matter to me? You'd go, well, that's one real secure and arrogant person. <laughs> no, your smile does matter. It matters greatly. The same way you like it when, when people tell you that either are above you at your work or below you at your work. Hey, good job. Hey, that encouraged me. Hey, that was awesome. It's, it's amazing. But if I have your smile and I don't have his something's off because even though the shirt says my church we all know it's not my church it's his church we know what we mean when we say my church it's his church it's his church obey your leaders submit to their authority so their work is a joy my work here is a joy um, have not had a day yet where i've said crud i've got to go to the church unless it was my day off and it's just because i forgot something <laughs> you gotta come up and get something i've not had a day yet where i go stink it's sunday haven't had that when the alarm goes off, that may not be true sometimes, but give me five minutes, it'll be all right. Uh, 1 Timothy 5, pastors are worthy of honor and wages if they're decent at their job. The elders who direct the affairs of the church are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, do not muzzle the ox. Is that what I'm being compared to, an ox? Can you see the resemblance? Is, is it the muscles and the girth? Ox? While it's treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. Pastors should be shared with. Uh, share all good things with your instructor. They should be willing to lead as servants. That's a weird sentence. Willing to lead as servants. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, overseers, not because you must, but because you're willing. If God's calling you to the ministry, you're not willing, done deal, we're done, that's not, that's not going to happen. 
if you're willing but God hasn't called you that's still a great place to be and there's people that have said God I'm willing is this what you want me to do and, and God's like nah I've got other things for you to do and you'll flourish at those and you'll be a blessing to any local church that you attend but no I'm not called you into the ministry like, but God seriously I want to we got a guy like that in our church he's an absolute God's gift to a local church and he's got family members that are in full time ministry I'm referring to our maintenance person Alan McClure Alan is an absolute gift to the local church his heartbeat for the church, his maturity, his, his, his uh, ethics, his labor, everything about him. And he's actually plays bass up here sometimes too. I think the only thing he doesn't do is stand up and do what I'm doing because he doesn't want to do that. <laughs> uh, pastors fr- face pressure on a daily basis for the church. This past week I was off work Tuesday through Friday. Uh, anyone know where Anderson, Missouri is? Anderson, Missouri? Right, we went down to Anderson, Missouri and went 10 miles out farther even out to the middle of nowhere called Bethpage. And uh, can't even really get cell phone reception out there, but somehow some emails found their way to my phone. And even though I was off work for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, I had church stuff to take care of all four days. Even though I'm at a cross, a 20-foot high cross, looking over a 200-acre meadow for a prayer spot, and I'm trying to connect with God personally, some of your prayer requests keep popping up in my heart. Not because I feel guilty that I don't pray for if I don't pray for them, but because they're on my heart. I couldn't just make them go away and get off my heart. Every job's got difficulties and hardships. Every job's got stress. So this is not a, uh, we got to sit and listen to the pastor complain about how hard his job is. No, I love my church. I love what I get to do. And every job's got difficulties. But some of your jobs have way more difficulties than I would want to handle. Our men's group that meets on Wednesday night, one of our icebreaker questions, we go around the room and say, hey, tell us what you did today. And you're not allowed to say, I went to work. Duh, we know you went to work. What'd you do at work? And so we go around the room, and we went around the room one day, and I said, yeah, I had to have a conversation with a family who's planning a funeral right now. They're going, oh, I don't want to do your job, I don't want to do your job. Someone else goes, well, I had to handle this over here, and we're like, I don't want to do your job. No one wanted to do anyone else's job in the entire room. Nobody. Nobody said, oh, your job's cake, I want that. Nobody. When I look at what some other people do for work, people that work construction, can you imagine they had to work construction this afternoon? It's going to be 90, 94, 95, heat index probably 99. That's going to be difficult. For me, I couldn't do that. Not because of the heat. I don't know what to do with those tools. I'm horrible at them. I mean, if I try to do a project that takes two trips for Home Depot, five times later, I'm back at Home Depot and I'm just throwing my hands up and barely staying saved. I'm horrible at it. I could not do that for work. I could not do sales. I have an utmost respect for people who do sales for work and have to make cold calls. And if you don't know what cold calls are, you haven't done sales for work. Who knows what a cold call is? Yeah, doing cold calls. Oh, I could not sell anybody a new car. Because I'm looking them in the eye and going, you don't need this car. I'm only selling you this car because it's going to benefit me if I sell you this car. You really should buy about a three-year-old three, three year old used car, and there's one in the back that I'm hoping I can buy, but I'm not telling you about it because i got to sell you this new car. I could not sell stuff like that. I couldn't do it. I'd be horrible at that kind of job, the pressure that came with that kind of job. Uh, some other jobs that I know I would not want to do, some of you do. Steve Snyder does this. Travis Bar- uh, uh, Barnett does this on the phone all day. And their job basically is, hi, my name's Steve. What is your complaint about our company that I can help you with? All stinking day. Is that not accurate? Well, you do customer service, Ugh. I could not do that. That kind of stress and pressure, it's outside of my league. But what I can talk about is what we deal with and is you being involved in a local church and probably involved in a local church down the road, helping you understand what pastors are doing. So I want to show you this list. This list came from this congregation last Sunday. Everyone had a slip of paper. It simply said, list three things you expect from your pastors. List down anything that you want. Are you ready to see it? It's a word cloud. The bigger the word, that means the more often it was mentioned. What do you expect of your pastors? Not just this guy. All the pastoral staff. Some people thought it was more like a suggestion box, which was kind of funny, because one person said, make us stand less. Okay, everyone gets chairs next week. Okay. (laughs) One one person put down there, uh, have the violin play more. Ta-da, violin. I didn't know it was being played until I saw it this morning. Some people got snarky with their comments. They said, what do you expect from your pastors? They should be Chiefs fans. (laughs) Oh, you laugh at that. You must have wrote that down, didn't you? Didn't you? (laughs) Can you imagine if we just took that and put that in the paper and said, Flag Church, now hiring. Here's the job expectations. 
I want to read you something. There's, normally, I don't read you things, so be patient with me. I want to share with you the mind of a pastor. Not this pastor, but what some other pastors have felt, and maybe some of the people in the room have felt as well. This is called the pastor's plight. The pastor, ooh, my screen just went dead. Come on back. The pastor of a church is in a precarious position because he can't please everybody. It has been said if he's young, he lacks experience. If his hair is gray, he's too old for the young people. If he has several children, he has too many. Hair's not gray up here. If he has several children, he has too many. If he has no children, he sets a bad example. If he preaches from his notes, his sermons are canned and too dry. If he doesn't use notes, he has not studied and is not deep. If he is attentive to the poor people in the church, they claim he's playing to the grandstand. But if he pays attention to the wealthy, he's trying to be an aristocrat. If he suggests changes for improvement in the church, he's a dictator. If he makes no suggestions, he's just a figurehead. If he uses too many illustrations, he neglects the Bible. If he doesn't use illustrations, he's not clear. If he condemns wrong, he's cranky. If he doesn't preach against sin, he's a compromiser. If he fails to please somebody, he's hurting the church and should leave. If he tries to please everyone, he's a fool. That's true. If he preaches about money, he's a money grabber. If he doesn't preach spiritual giving, he's failing to develop the people. If he drives an old car, 2006, if he drives an old car, he shames his congregation. Hope none of you are ashamed. If he drives a new car, he's setting his affection on earthly things. If he preaches all the time, the people get tired of hearing one man. If he invites guest speakers, he is shirking his responsibility. If he receives a large salary, he's a mercenary. If he receives only a small salary, well, it proves he wasn't worth much anyway. Ouch! Some pastor thought that was accurate. And apparently because it got shared enough online and I was able to find it, some people thought it was accurate. Again, this is not what I say. This is what some other pastors have said. Another pastor said this, I'm appalled at what's required of me. I'm supposed to move from the sick bed to the administrative meeting, to planning, to supervising, to counseling, to praying, to troubleshooting, to budgeting, audio systems, meditation, worship preparation, staff problems, missions projects, conflict management, community leadership, to study, to funerals, weddings, and preaching. I'm supposed to be in charge, but not too in charge. I'm supposed to be an administrative executive, a sensitive pastor, a skillful counselor, a dynamic public speaker, a spiritual guide, politically savvy, intellectually sophisticated, and superior or first rate in all those things. I'm never supposed to be depressed, discouraged, cynical, angry, or hurt. I am always supposed to be upbeat, positive, strong, willing, able, and interested. Right now, I'm not doing any of those things well. Maybe that's why I'm tired. Some pastors have written that. That's what some other pastors have said. With that average mindset of a pastor, Mom, Dad, God's called me into the ministry. Are you excited for him or scared for him? I hope you're both. The scared is probably the wrong word. hope you're excited for him and realizing that it may not be the easiest quote-unquote road to hoe. Ministry is amazingly fulfilling and it's awfully draining. This is what the congregation put together. Let me show you what our staff put together. What I asked them to is, what pressures do you feel? Because it's one thing what people expect of you, it's another thing what you feel yourself. And remember, these are perceptions, but sometimes perception is more important than reality. Your staff, not some staff online at some other church, your four pastors here, as well as Sarah, were included on putting this together. Again, if the word's larger, that means uh, it had more, more weight for us. There's some of those things on there you're going, ah, it's a piece of cake, ah, it's a piece of cake. There's some of those things on there you're going, I wouldn't want that as my, part of my job. And that's all right, this, this is my job. No complaints today at all. Which one of those would you say, Pastor? I want to pick that one up there, and I want to pray for our staff on that. I'm going to pick that, that, that big one there. I'm going to pick that small one there. I'm going to pick one of those. One of those. Next Sunday will be Father's Day. It'll also be marked 16 years that Sarah and I have been in Pittsburgh pastoring Family Life Assembly of God. I love what I do. I love where I get to do that. Men, you totally understand that if you love where you get to go to work and love who you get to work with, you got half a life made right there. Right there. I've yet to have a day where I come in and I go, crud, I've got to go to church. I am paid fairly. I have a great team. Expenses of ministry are reimbursed. You know, the other week, last week when I asked you, I told you about three things. And man, everyone started writing these down. Divert daily, withdraw weekly, abandon annually. I tried to abandon last week for four days. I got away most of the time. 
But even though I was in the middle of nowhere, it was still very difficult to, to get, get, get away. All these expectations, I'm going to tell you something that might surprise you. I think they're reasonable. Let's randomly pick some. Randomly. I'm just going to... I can't even find it. There you go. Pray for leadership. Yeah, I should, pastors should do that. Humble. Absolutely, they should be humble. Uh, someone I can look up to. Sure. Absolutely. Follow me as I'm following Christ. Not because I'm an awesome example, but because if you go the direction I'm going, that's where I'm aimed, you're probably going to end up somewhere good. Let's pick another random one. A listening ear. Who wants to have a leader that doesn't listen, whether that's in the church or not in the church? Uh, honor God in your life. Uh, I think some, I think big down here, practice what you preach. What kind of fraud would it be if you all found out I didn't tithe? I do. And the board has proof of it. The board has proof of it. Um, transparency and integrity. I don't know how you could have one without the other. Absolutely. I think it's all reasonable. So let me tell you why we're even mentioning it. It's all reasonable, but all of it, 24-7, 365, is too much. The constant withdrawal. What happens if, Paul, you're a banker, what happens if I only make withdrawals? I'm broke. <laughs> I'm broke. Well, you need to take a couple days off. I did. There's still withdrawals. So there needs to be a total disengaging. And that's what we call a sabbatical. Our church has adopted this policy over the past six or seven years. It's one, the pastor take, takes one month off and totally disappears from the church. We're going we're gonna to stay home. We're going to do a yard sale. We're going to travel a little bit. But we'll be off for an entire month. Uh, any questions you have on it? I want to take any questions you got, but there's, there's a fact. Frequently asked questions over at the Welcome Center. You can definitely pick it up. We do this every two years. Our policy is a full-time pastor gets one month off every two years of full-time service. I took my first one in 2011. I took one again in 2013. I was supposed to have one last summer, but could not make that happen. So that's why we, we're doing that this summer. Anthony's got one later this summer. Uh, he took one back in 2013 or 14. Uh, Tyler, when he was here, took one in 2013. Uh, Zeke and Marissa will have one in 2017, but it's one month off every two years of service. My sabbatical that I'll take one month off will start the Tuesday after Father's Day. So I'll be here next Sunday, and then I'm going to take a month off. Pastor, what if I go in the hospital? We have other quality pastors here on staff that are going to care for you. But Pastor, you're the one I connect to God through. That's bad. My goal is not that you have to come to me to connect to God. There's one mediator between man and God. My goal is hopefully to disciple you in such a way that you can go direct, direct, direct. That's the goal, and that's the purpose. Is it time to have help someone help to run with you? Absolutely, and hopefully pastors can do that. But the future of family lives, the future of this church is thinking amazing. So why are you taking a month off, pastor? So I can be around for the future. And that's why. Because if I didn't have those times off before, I probably still wouldn't be here. Because a burned out pastor is good to nobody, especially for the first four rows of his funeral. The people that matter the most in your life. And those relationships, I cannot afford to mess up or lose. So in that respect, just some time off. Zeke, can you bring your team up, friend? Now, it's not easy to admit that it's time for a break. I mean, this has been on the schedule, actually, for, well, ever since early January. Sarah and I were trying to find out what time this summer we're going to take the month off. The, uh, but especially as a man in front of many men in this room, I can, I, can, I can see the wheels that the enemy spinning in my head. Can't you hack it? I don't get a month off. Can't, can't you handle it? And honestly, I can man up to you and, and get in your face and go, yeah, I think I could. At what price? At what cost? It's not a matter of whether I could, I don't think. I think it's a matter of is it wise. You know, if I walk away from the fourth commandment, <laughs> if I walk away from spending time with God, is it wise? And what am I walking towards if I'm not walking towards wisdom? So that's why. For the sake of physical, mental, and emotional health, it's on the schedule. So we'll be doing that coming up. What I want to ask you to do would you look at that list that our staff put together? Would you pick one thing? These are pressures we feel. These are not complaints. Honestly, they're not complaints. This is part and parcel of what our career is, a part, part and parcel of the call of God in our life. Would you pick one? And over the next month or two, maybe the rest of the summer, just pray for that for your staff. Don't just do the generic prayer. God, please bless our pastors and thank you for this food. Amen. No, don't do that. Why don't you pick one? God, would you help our pastors when they don't feel spiritually strong? Would you be there to help them? 
when, they, when, they're, when they're being asked a question and they don't feel like they're full of wisdom and counsel and they really don't know what to say, would you help them to know they're not a failure because they don't have the right answer? Would you pick one? Maybe write it down, maybe tattoo it on your friend's arm, something like that, so you don't forget it. That would be great. Stand with me if you would. Don't tattoo it on your friend's arm. Don't do that. Mom, Dad, God's called me to the ministry. How should you respond? Watch. Turn the table. Respond to them the way you would want them to respond to you. Because just because you're past 24 doesn't mean God can't still call you. Ask Anthony. You know, that, you know that thing we do up here sometimes where we bring a little baby up here and we hold him and we pray over him and we do a dedication thing? Y'all remember that? What if God calls you on that, parents? Oh, my kid's 24 now. I remember that baby dedication. That was like 24 years ago. Yeah, what if God says, all right, I'm ready for him. I'm going to call him. God calls our bluff, doesn't he? Let's trust him. Let's trust him. Passion to bow your heads and your hearts. I'm not going to uh, dilly-dally. I'm not going to linger. But I want to make a simple invitation. Is God calling you into ministry? I'm not asking if he's calling you. I'm going to serve at my local church. No, that's not what I'm asking. Do you sense a nudge? And not because anyone's pushing you. Because if they're pushing you, run away from them. But do you sense a nudge from the Holy Spirit that God might be calling me into vocational ministry? If so, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand. I'm going to start on the right side of the room. Your left hand, my left hand side, your right hand side. Just lift your hand. The pastor, God might be nudging me on that. I see your hand, buddy. Anyone else? Each service has been a handful. I'm sure not expecting 50 people. But is God nudging you? Moving to uh, your left, my right. Is God nudging you about full-time ministry? Just put your hand up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm counting individually, so I'm not, you don't think I'm exaggerating. Father, I thank you for what you're doing. If you call, you pay the way. We don't want to call ourselves. Dear God, we don't want to call ourselves. But we're open. Seek first his kingdom. That's what we're trying to do. As Zeke and his team lead us, Lord, I actually fill this place with your presence, and our voices and our praise would honor you. In Christ's name, everybody says amen.